should mention that the, um, this um, 27th International Workshop in the History of Philosophy of Science is also supported um, by um, the philosophy department at Harvard University um, and by um, the research authority and faculty of the humanities at this university and with the kind support of the uh, wonderful, absolutely successful Khan Studies program that we've been running um, here for the graduate students for the last three years. Um, I thank those of you who uh, are here, and um, I hope I'll continue to thank you as you do your work. But um, there are some uh, who couldn't make it, um, and the first I would like to mention is Michael Glasberg, who was helpful and um, has um, deeply, sent his deep regrets for not being able to make it and um, well. Uh, nothing major, I think, for infection. Um, uh, someone else who was about who was planning on coming and couldn't is uh, Warren Gopher, who, um, upon asking him about um, is your smart? Ma Mark Steiner's conference in '87, told me that um, um, the topic was philosophy of mathematics, and the conference had several mathematicians as well as philosophers. He said, I think Tate, Parsons, and I might have been the only, uh, and I might have been the only Americans. Um, Mark mentioned something about Saul Kripke, um, but I think what was meant was that Saul was not <coughs> there. Um, he, uh, he said that uh, they had discovered radon gas in his basement. Oh, right. And he couldn't come to Israel because there was radon gas in his basement of Princeton. I see. <laughs> <laughs> he needed to consult his lawyers. Well, um, Warren remembers um, Charles and Bill schlepping up the hill and Ellie and Warren giving them a ride. Uh, so, uh, but Charles was here and with us with Bill and quite a few others. Um, in, 2009, which I was here a few years before. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of traveling involved. Uh, I won't say very much now about the title of this conference and why I chose to switch um, the title of a paper by Charles uh, around, but um, I hope that'll be figured out as we um, go. The first session. Um, um, is going to be chaired by Peter Kölner, whom I also want to thank for a few very, very few comments that he made as I was organizing this, which were very helpful um, for the university so chair. Um, the first speaker will be speaking in absentia, and um, just wanted to. Um, say he hopes his own contribution goes well technically, um, but also um, asked him to say that um, the video was made with the invaluable technical assistance of his student, Eric Buchholz. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce um, two of my philosophical heroes and mentors. Solomon Fefferman and Bill Tate on the occasion of a conference in honor of the third of my philosophical heroes and mentors, Charles Parsons. Saul's going to be the, the first speaker. He's worked in pretty much every area of mathematical logic and philosophical logic. So he did early work in foursome in set theory, and he's done work in model theory and recursion theory, but he really distinguished himself in proof theory with his work on autonomous progressions of theories and the analysis of predictivity. In philosophical logic, he's worked in truth theory, he's worked on the foundations of category theory, and he's also um, recently, and tapping into some much older work of his, worked on categoricity, which is a theme which is central to Charles' work, particularly <coughs> this latest book. 
So today he's going to speak to us on categoricity of open-ended systems. Solve that. If you don't mind, I'd like to address this first part uh, directly to Charles. Uh, and then I'll have some slides to present uh, of a less than regular length talk. But uh, I, I want to use this first part to say how much uh, Charles means to me. And um, when I was invited to attend this conference a couple of years ago, I said, of course, I'd like to come because of my long friendship uh, with Charles and how much that means to me, has meant to me, and also how important his, his work has been for me, uh, both in logic and uh, philosophy. Well, as it turned out, uh, it hasn't been possible for me to come. And uh, as a result, um, Ofra suggested that uh, it might be possible to uh, be present in the, at least electronically by uh, doing this video recording. And at first I resisted that, but uh, he asked me, and so um, this, this is the result. And um, I know uh, you can't answer back, but uh, perhaps somebody in the audience can uh, take a, a mini video via their cell phone and, and send that back. Uh, I, I should say, though, I. I cannot uh, accept tweets. I don't, that's not in my repertoire. I don't know anything about tweets or anything like that. So uh, the first thing uh, I, I want to say is that um, um, something about when Charles and I met, that was in 1957, so that's uh, 56 years ago at the Cornell Institute, uh, Summer Institute in Logic, a month-long institute that was very important for, for many people. Uh, I was there among a group of uh, fresh PhDs, and Charles uh, had come as uh, a beginning or just early graduate student, uh, beginning, um, you were beginning your work with uh, Drebin and Quine at that time. and. Uh, so in the eyes of uh, us uh, new PhDs, uh, we, we thought of you as a baby and uh, perhaps didn't give you as much attention as we should have because, uh, well, within a few years, um, uh, you, you did uh, your own PhD um, and um, we then recognized uh, what a great contribution that was to, um, to proof theory. Uh, actually, um, it, uh, the understanding of it and the appreciation of it came over a period of time, uh, but it has been proved, uh, in fact, that work continues to be useful, uh, various parts of it. I've, I've appealed to it from time to time myself in, in my own work. Uh, I have to say that um, I was uh, disappointed that, that you left proof theory for philosophy. I understand that uh, Really, philosophy perhaps was your first uh, true love. Uh, your work in proof theory certainly was philosophically motivated and, and uh, was uh, well done in that respect. Um, I can't say that I, I know your work in philosophy as well as, as others do. I, I expect that at this conference there will be um, a great uh, deal of testimony to its uh, depth and breadth but I have, I have read uh, a fair amount, and uh, while we have a uh, number of points of agreement and uh, also of disagreement, uh, I, I, I just want to say uh, what I particularly value in your writing is um, how cogent uh, and uh, judicious it is. And um, that is... Uh, 
when reading it, I, I just feel like we're engaged in a conversation and uh, of, of a kind that we've been able to have from time to time over the years, and that that's just a, a continuation of that kind of conversation. So uh, all that mean, means a lot to me, and I, I, I do want to say I thank you for that. And um, thank you for all that you've done uh, in philosophy, especially uh, for me, f what you've done in the philosophy of mathematics. Um, what I do want to now say uh, more about, and which the audience may not be as familiar with, is your very, very important contribution to the a Gödel collected works. Uh, first as a contributor um, to volume two, and then as um, co-editor and uh, further contributed to, to, to the remaining volumes, volumes uh, three to five. So in volume two, um, you uh, gave us a couple of important introductory notes. One was on um, Gödel's uh, article on Russell's mathematical logic that was uh, generally regarded as a very difficult uh, article and, and you, introductory note, uh, made many things clear there and it was, was quite illuminating and, and important. And the second note uh, on uh, Gödel's address, to the, uh, imp important address to the uh, Princeton Bicentennial in 19, uh, 1946. So uh, I know all of the, both of those cost you a good deal of work, but then um, when it came to volume three and, and on, uh, turned out that we needed um, actually three new co-editors, and one of the first people I thought of was, was to invite you to do that, and, and uh, I'm so happy that you agreed. Of course, you didn't expect, nor did I expect, that uh, from that uh, time on, it would uh, cost us uh, another 15 years uh, to, to complete that work. Um, and um, your dedication to that was um, really supremely important to see us all through, uh, not only the work that you did uh, in writing various uh, quite important uh, introductory notes, both in volume three and in the volumes of correspondence, volumes four and five, but also in keeping us on track and uh, reviewing what uh, others had done in the way of contributions, and in general, uh, all around as a wonderful co-editor. So I, re I really want to thank you for that. Uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> uh, and more recently, of course, we had uh, our work together with uh, Steve Simpson uh, as uh, co-editors of the volume of essays for the uh, lecture notes and logic on uh, uh, essays uh, for Gödel Centennial. And again, um, really, we, we could not have uh, done that without you. So uh, quadruple thanks. Um, so. Just to, to bring uh, this part to an end, uh, uh, if I had been able to come, I would have contributed a regular uh, talk. Um, so what instead I'm uh, going to do in the rest here is um, a kind of an introduction and outline of uh, the talk I would have given and uh, the, uh, on um, open-ended systems as a, as a framework for uh, a kind of logic of mathematical practice. And in this part, uh, I want only to talk about uh, uh, the relation of that to proofs of categoricity, um, and mainly their categoricity arithmetic. Now, even so, I think this part uh, has uh, things of mutual interest and uh, I very much appreciate it if you have, just on the basis of what you'll see in the following, if you have some comments to send me, I'd greatly appreciate them. Uh, of course, I will want to contribute uh, a full-length paper for the proceedings uh, when uh, that, that's in the works. <clears throat>
So, um, also, if the audience has any comments, uh, that too would be greatly appreciated. So I'm going to sign off now from this part, and uh, we will proceed to the slides. Thank you. Yes, so the title of this is Categoricity and Open-Ended Axiom Systems. And it's part of a larger program to provide a kind of logic of mathematical practice. Uh, it's a program that I've been thinking about for a long time, um, but only recently have I tried to put uh, it down in somewhat more detail, uh, although I, I had uh, the general framework in mind, uh, for, as I say, for some time. Uh, of course, the details, since I've only started to uh, work on that uh, recently, are subject to change. Uh, of course, we know that mathematicians in practice uh, have a very different view of practice from logicians in the sense that they pay uh, little or no attention to logic uh, or formal axiomatics in, in systems, uh, formal axiomatics in the sense of logicians. For example, piano arithmetic at one end uh, uh, and Samuel Frankel at the other uh, as, as typical examples. Uh, there's a deeper difference that I want to emphasize, and that is that, first of all, uh, mathematicians take uh, the basic number systems as uh, givens, as granted, uh, without thinking about the axiomatic principles involved, the natural numbers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers. Uh, and um, they use certain basic principles, for example, about the natural numbers over and over again as applied to arbitrary uh, notions that occur all over the place in, in mathematics. So uh, when we prove a, uh, carry out a proof by induction on the natural numbers, it may apply to a property that appeals to mathematical concepts that are far distant from the natural numbers. And similarly, uh, when we define a function by recursion on the natural numbers. Uh, and then for the real numbers, um, mathematicians are constantly maximizing or minimizing various kinds of uh, functions or sets. Uh, uh, we think of the uh, least upper bound principle for the real numbers uh, as logicians within a, a fixed language. But uh, for mathematicians, this has to be applied no matter uh, where uh, that's appropriate in mathematics. So none of these are dealt with from a uh, logician's point of view via formal systems in fixed vocabularies. Um, so what I call this uh, framework uh, tentatively is uh, OEMP, uh, Open-Ended uh, Mathematical Practice, a system for that. And what this does is to treat uh, basic schemata and logic, arithmetic, analysis, and set theory in an open-ended way. To begin with, the induction principle on the natural numbers, given a property of natural numbers, which may appeal to any concepts that are meaningful to mathematicians. Um, if it holds of zero and is closed under successor, then it holds of natu all natural numbers. Whereas when we turn to the real numbers, if we have a property of real numbers, which is bounded above, uh, then the least upper bound principle tells us that uh, the supremum of the set of real numbers, which uh, satisfies that property, again, which may uh, involve concepts from any part of mathematics, uh, has a least upper bound, the supremum exists. And uh, turning to set theory, uh, when we're separating a set from uh, a given set A, given any property of elements of A, which is meaningful for elements of A mathematically, uh, which is a definite property of, of elements of A, we would say that uh, uh, that uh, set, set of X in A, which satisfies that property, forms a set. So uh, as logicians, of course, we want to say, well, which piece which properties are to be admitted to these schemata, but for the mathematician, that will not be uh, something to be considered, only that uh, if 
the property in, in, uh, under uh, concern is uh, already understood to be mathematically definite and meaningful, it will be uh, something we can apply in schema two. So in outline, the uh, system of um, open-ended systems for mathematical practice has an ontology which is uh, quite pluralistic in contrast to uh, very familiar formalisms for uh, encompassing mathematical practice. Uh, it's based on a, a universe that uh, includes all the objects that we want to be talking about. Um, quite heterogeneous, it will consist of our particular number systems, uh, and uh, in general, it will consist of, it will have among its uh, entities sets, functions, operations, classes, properties, and so on. And some of these uh, uh, are treated extensionally, as in uh, our current set theory, sets and functions in particular, but others, it turns out to be. Um, more advantageous, uh, and more appropriate to treat them uh, intentionally, and among these are operations in my setup, operations, classes, and properties. Um, so the operations um, should be applicable to uh, arbitrary elements uh, of you. So uh, among the sets, we'll have the natural numbers and the real numbers, uh, and perhaps uh, other basic number systems that we might want to include as basic. And we'll have closure conditions, uh, including uh, exponentiation of sets and formation of power sets and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, fundamental schemata for these will be considered open-ended. Um, operations themselves uh, are things that can apply uh, not only to sets and functions, but uh, can be uh, applied to um, classes, can be applied to properties as, uh, as operations on properties. We simply have logical operations as operations on classes. We have operations like union, intersection, complement, and so on. But we also have operations on operations, such as the composition of two operations uh, and uh, the um, uh, iteration of an operation. And um, since operations can apply to operations, it uh, uh, gives us freedom to allow thinking about operations applicable to themselves. And for that reason, uh, the best and simplest uh, framework in which to talk about operations is a type-free framework. Uh, so I have uh, as variables for operations uh, of FGH uh, applicable to arbitrary objects in the universe, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. The universe is supposed to be closed under a pairing uh, from which we construct, uh, <coughs> of course, n tuples for any n. Now, because uh, it, the uh, setup is uh, type-free, uh, and uh, uh, for other reasons, the, um, although an extensional treatment is possible, the simplest way of, uh, of dealing with this is to think of these intentionally, that is, the operations as given by rules. And um, they may be possibly partial, since uh, an object, uh, an operation uh, applied to itself may or may not be defined. The identity operation, for example, applied to anything, gives that back, and in particular applied to itself, it gives it back, whereas other natural operations certainly don't apply to themselves. So we're dealing with partial operations in general, and we want to have the uh, relation of being defined, the, the predicate of being defined at a, at a given object. And as usual, we in the kind of currying set up instead of uh, binary operations. Uh, we can simply write fxy, or uh, if we prefer, form the pair of x and y, apply f to that pair. And as basic uh, axioms for this, 
uh, either the anti-partial lambda calculus uh, or the partial uh, combinatory algebra. They're based on Curry combinators, would be uh, all that we need, uh, as augmented by a pairing of projection operators and definition by cases. Um, and uh, we would, as in ordinary recursion theory, use the uh, abbreviation S equally equal T means that uh, if either S or T is defined, then both are defined, and S equals T. So a fundamental theorem that we get out of that setup uh, quite quickly is that there is a term R such that for every operation F, R of F is defined. And the value of R of F and X may or may not be defined, but when defined, it gives the same value as F at R, F, and X. So if we write G uh, equals, uh, if we write uh, G for uh, the value of R, F, we have G of X is F of G of X for all X. And so that's a quite general form of recursion that that provides. Turning now to arithmetic, and to see how this works. Um, the structure of natural numbers it will be given to us as uh, a set N together with two operations, successor and predecessor, and the uh, constant zero. It's assumed to satisfy the usual axioms for zero, successor, and predecessor. And uh, saying that the successor is one, one, and that the predecessor of successor is the, uh, at X is, is X itself. Uh, and, of course, we'll have the open-ended scheme of induction. Now, the recursion theorem quite uh, quickly implies that we can obtain uh, <coughs> definition by primitive recursion on uh, n into u, uh, which is shown to be total for, for uh, some suitable uh, initial function f. Uh, and one note that uh, we would be concerned with as logicians is that here we will be applying a, a proof by induction and in that proof by induction we're saying that uh, proving by induction that something is defined and uh, behaves in a certain way and that simply makes use of a property P that is a positive uh, and quantifier free in the relation of application and uh, of definedness. So now that can be applied to establish the categoricity of n as follows, that if we're given another structure, the m prime, successor prime, predecessor prime, zero prime, which satisfies the axioms of the structure of natural numbers, including open-ended induction, we use our recursion theorem in its primitive recursive form to define an operation g, which is zero prime and zero, and which preserves successor, and uh, we show by induction on n uh, that um, it's defined, and in fact that the value of g prime at uh, g of x, where g prime is defined like uh, g on the structure n prime, that g prime at g of x is equal to x for each x in n. It follows, of course, that uh, g is one to one, and uh, similarly, we prove that g applied to g prime of y equals y for all y and n prime uh, by induction on n prime, and hence g is onto. So that simply tells us that these two structures are uh, isomorphic, uh, end of proof of categoricity. Now, what's involved here, I, in a way, speaking philosophically, is what I think of as the principle of charity. If you come to me with your structure of natural numbers and say, well, the things I believe about it are such and such involving zero, successor, predecessor, and induction, uh, and you have something that you think is, is clearly in mind that satisfies those things uh, by the principle of charity, I accept that as, and uh, say, well, that's no different in, in structural terms from what I except as the natural numbers, these are in fact uh, isomorphic. Uh, from a logician's point of view, uh, we can say something about just uh, which part of OEMP is needed to carry out this proof of categoricity. 
and it's easily seen that just that purpose for alone, gene. for the categoricity of, of arithmetic, we're not using any more than sigma one induction axiom, since so we can interpret the uh, operations as codes for uh, partial recursive functions, and uh, with definiteness uh, as usual, and uh, then uh, the properties uh, uh, that we need of definiteness and uh, uh, equality, squiggly equality, uh, those are all sigma one properties and uh, quantifier free, and so we can apply, uh, uh, sorry, there's sigma one properties, uh, and because what I had uh, made use of was uh, quantifier free uh, positive statements in the uh, application relation and definiteness relation. Um, our proofs by our induction are simply formulated uh, within sigma one induction axiom it can be interpreted in that. And hence by uh, Parsons' well-known theorem, the strength of that does not go beyond primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, the theorem that was proved independently by uh, uh, Grisha Mintz and uh, Gaizi uh, Takeuchi. Now it happens that uh, Simpson and Yokoyama uh, published an article in the Annals of Pure and Applied Logic for 2012, in which they showed that the categoricity of the natural numbers is equivalent to Wee Kernig's lemma uh, zero. We WKL sub zero in second order arithmetic over uh, RCA sub zero, but the proof is uh, quite quite a bit more complicated than what, what I have here. Uh, and in addition, uh, with what I have to tell you next, uh, uh, my uh, approach to this uh, allows one to think about categoricity in uh, uh, in a much more general setting. So, for example, if we want to show uh, categoricity of the power set of the natural numbers over the natural numbers, or in general, uh, of the power set of A over any set A, uh, we simply will add the operation, which I indicated earlier, of forming the set of X in A such that P of X, where P is any uh, mathematical property, uh, definite mathematical property of, uh, of elements of A, and given that operation, we'll be able to quite quickly establish cat categoricity. And then by introducing um, that ordinals uh, or sets in the cumulative hierarchy, we can uh, carry out proofs of categoricity for uh, finite and suitable uh, transfinite iterations. Uh, so we can quickly get a form of uh, Termelo's uh, semi-categoricity uh, results for the cumulative hierarchy. And in a quite straightforward way without uh, anything fancy uh, when, once we have this framework. Just uh, a final note for uh, logician's sake. Um, the uh, full system of OEPM that I have considered so far uh, may be shown to be consistent relative to a system of what I call operational set theory uh, that uh, I have uh, uh, published an article on that you can find uh, in, in my uh, bibliography. Uh, it's consistent relative to that plus the power set operation. Uh, quite recently that's been shown to be equivalent in strength to kripke platek plus the power set operation. Um, the exact relation of OST plus power to kripke platek plus power was uh, not known. Um, we knew that that uh, was a, a lower bound and the same plus V equals L was an upper bound. But uh, uh, Rachin, Michael Rachin has shown that uh, in fact the, those two are different in strength, but here we have equality of strength. So that's all I have to tell you about today. Hopefully when I write this up, I'll have uh, somewhat more to tell you uh, to fill in uh, what I say above about uh, higher order categoricity results. Thank you for your attention.
יש מיקרופון שם. מיקרופון. in his comments I found uh, particularly gratifying, particularly the first the indication that the rather modest work in proof theory that I did in my younger days is not completely forgotten. Uh, it's second, about my participation in the Google editorial project, which uh, says something about my career overall. That is, the fact is that editing has played a rather large role in it, uh, because of two quite long term commitments. One earlier than that, namely the being an editor of the Journal of Philosophy, uh, which and, and I still do some work for the Journal of Philosophy, so that hasn't completely come to an end. And the other was the Google project, project, which, as he said, uh, went on for fully 15 years after I joined it. And he and John Dawson uh, had been editors for a little while before that. Mm -hmm. uh, just one substantive remark, which is, um, uh, is the way he presented his own categoricity result for uh, uh, the, about the natural numbers, there I found echoes of what one might call the dialogue argument uh, on the question of the uniqueness of the natural numbers, which. Um, uh, was actually first presented at the 1987 Congress uh, in Jerusalem organized by Mark. Uh, and the paper that resulted uh, was published in the Israeli journal, Yun. Uh, what's in my book, Mathematical Thought and Its Objects, I think is a better version of the argument. Uh, the result, naturally enough, of uh, thinking about thinking about it over time, uh, he suggests something that maybe I should have done but did. That is, I resisted trying to give the uh, same sort of argument about set theory. Uh, because it seemed to me that disagreements about principles were, were an obstacle. Uh, but uh, he himself, in his own framework, seems to have things to present about, so to speak, intermediate levels of mathematics in terms of uh, strength and possibly problematic uh, character. Uh, and that suggests that there are places intermediate between uh, or number theory and set theory where I might have tested uh, the idea that I was working with, but in fact didn't. Also, 
leading to cataclysmic to the to cataclysmic results both for this you know, natural and uh, and I guess the segments of uh, of the set theory. I think it's the same notion of, of, of the notion of a property where that, that isn't specified in any particular form. That, that part, uh, I, I think that, uh, that uh, Martin mentions Saul on that connection. Not in the multiple years. Well, um, maybe we should go back to sharing, and I will, it'll be a general practice, I suppose, through the conference that um, we'll have plenty of time for discussion, and Charles will have a chance to have a say whenever he feels like it um, after talks, including the next one. <laughs>